What does one do with three wishes? You'll see. <laughs> I have a wish. <laughs> Justin, you'll appreciate this. Uh, I think that you and others would qualify this as like a Trevorism. Um, I just replaced my curtain rod. Uh, in this room and so it's no longer a like two panel thing it's like a single panel curtain and the reason for that is I bought a little robot that sits on the railing it has like a little claw and like wheels on it and the idea is that you set it in between two of the grommets of a curtain and it'll just like run along it'll like a little train track on your curtain rod and it'll open and close your curtain for you. I have a few offer observations just right off the bat. Okay. One. Let's hear them. Um, you are, yeah, you are right. That is totally a Trevorism. Um, when you say robot, I don't think just like an automated device. I think of a uh -huh. robot. So I, I think of like, like a, a, I think of like a Sky Mall gadget. Like you paid, uh, like, uh, eighty dollars and you bought uh -huh. like the world's shittiest little plastic like <laughs> thing right and he has uh -huh. like a little robot like facade and uh -huh. it like shittily moves across the <laughs> it like it like skitters across the curtain rod and does nothing yeah. um, and then on that note i appreciate because I, I know you have like sort of a um like higher standards when it comes to this sort of thing so mm -hmm. I know that you did not buy a Sky Mall level gadget. It was it was like sort of a higher higher tier than that, and that's even more funny to me that mm -hmm. it's like a, <laughs> it's like a really it's like a nicer version of like a shitty Sky Mall trinket that you'd get. Mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. like that idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the it's the Chrome edition uh of the sky mall robot well not and not even like in a superficial way like it's actually better or you know it's not just like a piece of shit but mm -hmm. it is something that um the concept of it attracts pieces of shit technology so like yes you have a working version of something that anyone else would go to brookstone yeah. and just buy and use once and never again because it doesn't really work well yeah it's like a, the modern day equivalent is you you type a product category into Amazon and like there's 10 different like Chinese brands that right. uh, all are like the exact same thing. They're just like branded differently. Yeah. Um, and they're called things like Skebmo and um, Popper2. They're like they're yeah. like semblances of English. Yeah, yeah. The, I have so many shit that like has completely nonsensical names. Like I don't think it represents anything in any language. Yeah. Like uh, I'm like looking for something because surely like some of my stuff has that. But I definitely whatever. see that uh, on Amazon clothing. Like if I just need like a just like a ten pack of underwear or something, right? Like not something that I'm concerned about. Really concerned about the quality of as long as it's like comfortable to wear. And a lot of the mm -hmm. time it is just those Chinese companies and they're just like, there's a million of them. Uh, they're not, I wouldn't even call them companies, whatever they are, right? Manufacturers and they just have the wildest names. And I do think it's like, I do think it's like um, supposed to strike the balance between being a unique like brand name and something that's appealing to like American audiences. And yeah. they don't really toe that line well. It yeah. feels like AI generated names. We need an example. We need an example of a I name know. here. To I like don't, bring yeah. this home. Whatever. Fubu. Fubu. Yeah, this episode's this episode's brought to you by Fubu underwear. <laughs> I'm about ready to turn over all my underwear. 
oh yeah yeah pretty exciting. once every like five years or whatever the, yeah yeah i bought like all the same is. kinds yeah and yeah i'm not quite ready to let go of them yet but yeah. when the time comes that's the way to do it is to just undies. bulk buy like buy yeah. like yeah. 30 pairs of underwear and just those are your underwear now because mm-hmm. yes. they all get worn the exact same amount of times you hopefully wear each one until they're dirty right yeah it's a daily it's a daily usage article of clothing so yeah. like you burn through them pretty quickly i don't know about you guys but i'm burning through underwear oh yeah <laughs> do you want to hear the uh the new york what the new york times has to say about three thousand years of longing i kind of don't i mean like <clears throat> fundamentally i don't but i do want to hear what you were about to say okay um this is a couple paragraphs down certainly miller whose fables include the mad max series is keenly interested in the power of stories but in the years of longing he has tethered himself to hopeless uninvolving source material yeah i don't i don't blistering i don't find either of those words like i i don't think this is an unimpeachable movie we can get into it but i think there are problems to be had i don't think either of those words apply though uh which two the the what did you say uninvolving and what was the other hopeless one? hopeless yeah i don't find either of those uh correct at all uh-huh i don't even know what the source material is uh it is a short story by mm-hmm. oh i'm i'm not even gonna try to are you guys talking name. about the movie no what are you talking about um chinese companies huh um yeah it's based on the short story the Jin and the nightingale's eye by a yeah, we were talking about the movie there we go okay. you want to hear the new york times take on on the, the movie yeah please okay certainly miller whose fables include the mad max series is keenly interested in the power of stories but in years of longing he has tethered himself to hopeless uninvolving source material it's a bad review okay <laughs> whenever told, a review like I, like comes out and just like blasts like this i'm always like what's going on in the reviewer's life yeah <laughs> that this movie made them mad yeah well i told Raul, well, i don't think either of those uh adjectives describe the movie at all like you i have problems with the movie i don't think it's perfect but i don't think the yeah. movie is uninvolving or hopeless i think it's both i think it's the opposite of on both yeah. counts. yeah i don't uh there seems to be quite a bit of hate for this movie. Yeah? Yeah, from what I've gathered. I gotta say, I went in, you know, with no... I didn't look up anything. I wasn't even, like, planning on watching the movie because we, like, pivoted to discuss this movie for the episode very mm-hmm. last minute. And mm-hmm. so I just watched it last night. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And really liked it a lot, but... Yeah. Yeah, point is, I just... I, I hadn't read anything since or beforehand. I've listened to like ten minutes of uh, Blank Check's thing on it. Um, oh, but cool! That's it. Yeah, they liked it as you would expect. But they were—they've yeah. been doing George Miller, or do they? Just no, do I new think movies? that this is—I think this is the rare case where they want—they covered a new movie because it was mm. interesting. Um, interesting. They well, they actually. So what they do is uh, they did cover George Miller. Um, I think back right around the pandemic and. Um, whenever a new movie comes out by a director they've covered in the past, they mm. just do it to I see. continue the series, basically. But um, yeah, I uh, I mean, we could, I guess we can get into it whenever. But I'm very positive on this movie. I really like it. I loved it. I, in fact, I like it too. I went to go see this movie. Um, I want to put some context uh, for my viewing. I went to go see it with some friends who were a little like on the fence about going to see the movie as according to the trailer. Um, Uh And like that was sort of, I feel like if you watch the trailer, you're like on board, just Mm. like regardless of who you are, you're like, I'm going to see that movie, whatever it is. Um, And the fact that they had sort of a a muted response to that uh, and then just after they had sort of had that response, Justin texted me. He's like, it's not exactly what the trailer says it's going to be. And so then I was definitely like, these people will hate this movie. Like if they were like, eh, about the trailer and it's not that at all, like they're going to hate it. Um, but they walked out actually thoroughly enjoying it for the reasons that you thought 
uh, you, you get what I'm trying to say here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That they were. They I would were say I was in that camp. They were expecting like the trippy movie, the crazy right. wall-to-wall action uh-huh. movie, but they got a more subdued storybook movie, and that was much more agreeable with them. Yeah, I think yeah. the movie the movie does a really good job of um, satisfying both camps. Like, if someone goes in expecting or maybe desiring the hotel room scenes, I think they get those. Um, pretty equitably and i think those scenes are great i really love those scenes and if they want the you know the sumptuous splashy pageantry of the tales um those are also there in full force like and i think um maybe not an equal measure but i think you would leave satisfied if you're either one of those people um i I, I would say with the trailer um if i had to, to sum up my reaction to um the trailer itself it would be it would be that yeah because i thought the trailer was great (laughs) i was like i was pumped um because of that trailer yeah yeah if we talked about it i think last time we talked where you had watched that trailer like multiple times just because it gets you so jazzed yeah it really did uh yeah i loved it yeah i was definitely like ready for like a mad max genie movie according to the trailer Um, right but i was not i was also in the camp of like i was pleasantly surprised i was not disappointed by the lack of that at all yeah i think it'll be a nice once we have the remove of i don't know like a decade to look back and you look at um fury road this and fingers crossed uh furiosa assuming Mm furiosa is good and delivers what mad max delivered like i think it'll be a nice three movie run with a nice pace of balls to the wall fury road shit uh, an unusual endearing charming mm-hmm. inventive movie and then whatever furiosa delivers like i'm i'm just i think that'll be a good you know tripartite experience but yeah. i guess that remains to be seen yeah that's a nice way of looking at it it's an intermission movie sure you have a nice nice little break right uh from the desert engines you know, I'm actually not very familiar with George Miller. Like, other than Mad Max, I can't really think of anything else that I would know him from. Can That's you guys with your... Thing. Is that it? Um, Babe, Pig in the City. Oh, okay. Shit. Yeah, the sequel, it's, it, it's just the, the second movie. Just, right? it's not, just Pig yeah. in the City. Happy mm-hmm. Feats, uh, Happy's Feet, one and two. Um, Witch, uh, Witches of Eastwick, uh, which was like a TV... It was one of those movies when I was a kid that was always on TV. Um, Lorenzo's Oil. Yeah, Mad Max. There's probably one I'm forgetting. Huh. Sort of a kind of strange, eclectic filmography. Super eclectic, yeah. And this is a good. This movie is just a great <laughs> example of like uh, the way he can stretch himself because I think going back to the dichotomy between uh, the hotel room scenes and the, the gin tales, like... I think he he excels at both in really like uh different and interesting ways like those hotel room scenes are so restrained and low-key even when you have uh idris elba being the size of a room and like pulling einstein out of a tv it's still like it's pretty low-key and very straightforward Mm -hmm. um uh and i think it's uh well it's still well executed um, and so to have that next to those crazy, the story of Solomon and whatnot, I think it's a testament to his strengths. Sure, sure. Yeah. Where do you want to go from here? Uh, maybe we uh, walk through the plot a little bit. I know that, like, last time we just, like, jumped right in, which is fine by me, but to a, an external party, it might not make a lot of yeah. sense. So, uh I'd like that. Let's do a little step by, like play by play. Okay. Because um, a lot did happen. I kind of, yeah. I like lost the, track. I like the way the movie opens up, where it it feels kind of. This is probably like more transcendent than what I'm gonna say, but it. I was gonna say Disney. It felt like just a storybook. Is there literally like a shot of like a book with like pages turning in it, or am I making that? Um, there is at the end. So maybe that's coloring it. I don't remember if there okay. is one at the beginning, but yeah, totally. I mean, it captures that same spirit of like yeah. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tell a story. Well, right and now. it's Here's... once upon a time, yeah. 
Thought I cut out for a second. My internet connection. Did you notice that? Oh, I didn't notice anything. Okay. (laughs) No, you're good. (laughs) I'm going to go in the other room. (laughs) I saw you waving. I didn't know if you were trying to. I have something to say. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's like once upon a time and it feels like it's being narrated from out of time because she talks about like... Uh. I, I like that how they describe uh, phones as tiles. People held tiles in their phones, right. and yeah. I forget yeah. how where she goes from there. But it's this. That, yeah, describes them as like tiles that can summon love songs. I'm like, yeah, I guess they can do that. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Kind of underselling totally. it. And it's a good. I mean, yeah, sort of harkens to what comes later with the genie. But I think uh, yeah. I think it definitely feels like a storybook. Yeah, I love that. I felt like the way that it was describing technology through that sort of fable lens was like uh, a pretty interesting version of that. Like glass tiles that summon love songs. Yeah, like that is what they do, but it feels very uh, storybook simplified. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's like one thing that they could do if you were talking about this out of time, but maybe the people who who are listening to the story don't understand what those things are. Right. It, it, It got me into whatever the universe that that story might be told in uh yeah pretty effectively i uh i i love that like the way that this movie kind of tried to weld together kind of old style stories and myth telling with contemporary like science and technology and whatnot um, electromagnetism right right and, and it did this yeah. th- uh, through a lot of points in the movie Mm-hmm. Um, so it seemed like something that I was trying to undertake, and I really appreciated that. Like, yeah, um, that's like that's like a new thing in movies, right? It's the uh, all like ancient magic can be explained with science. Like, I don't know what the quote is, Justin. You probably do, but the uh, any sufficiently sophisticated technology is indistinguishable from magic. What, whoever, whatever said that? Um, I feel like that is. Uh, injected into movies like wholesale anytime there's like magic in your movie like since i don't know 2010 yeah um i think it's a really so i think there's two interesting things about that one is um it's it it sort of that's exactly what the theme is of of the movie right is it's the genie at odds with i'm sorry the djinn at odds with um our modern world and he can't live in our modern world because we have sort of um we have sort of degraded magic into this into our little tiles and our tiles are then broadcast as <laughs> like mm-hmm. painful electromagnetism or, or whatever it is right mm-hmm. so there's that um and then also oh i had a second point three two one and the first point was pretty good yeah i'll come We're... back to it i'll come back to it well, I was talking about how, like, that's, like, very pervasive in movies now. What's, like, another yeah. example? Like, Thor. Yeah. Like the first Thor oh, oh yeah. No, I was going to say, I think uh, George Miller and the screenwriter, who is his daughter, um, told this, really, right. this, told this really interesting line where, like, um, they they get into the quote-unquote rules of, of the djinn, which is, like, also a thing that people are really into in pop culture now. But without, mm-hmm. um, but without belaboring it or letting it, um, like letting it drag down the narrative, like it drives the narrative because he's dying from it. But it doesn't like get into the weeds of mm-hmm. what are his powers, how does he, how does he control time and space, blah 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 blah. I think that kind mm-hmm. of stuff uh, can can get really tiresome and irrelevant. Totally, totally. It seems like when it the part of the movie and then I'll, we'll get back into like trying to go step by step here uh the part of the movie where he is with the renaissance genius uh woman his second love um it seems like it it sort of like starts to get into uh where science and magic meet like if you can unlock the secrets of the universe with just math and how do you actually do that it seems like the movie sets it up where it's beyond our understanding as the audience and that's just the way it is it like attempting to explain it would 
be kind of meaningless because the the movie sets it up as like an un like magic and those sorts of things are an ununderstandable thing yeah but but also um alongside that i love that he's not just snap your fingers and you have all the knowledge or snap your fingers and you the sultan is in love with you it's um i want the sultan to fall in love with me okay i'll make these oils for you yeah. Or I want to have all the knowledge in the world. Okay, let me grab all these books, and you'll read all right. the books. Teaching it to her. Yeah, right. Yeah. So like, there's a. It's an element of magic because where does he get all these books from? Where does he get those oils from? But also, mm-hmm. it's not just. There's a process. I think. I think that's something that we haven't seen before, or at least, you know, don't see often is a process to the magic. Yeah, process magic. Yeah, that's cool. DIY. Mm-hmm. Uh, genie yeah <laughs> which, which genie. totally feels re- like it feel it makes it feel so real like he's not yeah. just a he's not just this unknowable creature unfathomable creature he's like someone who comes from a different place and has different logic and rules and regulation in the world but he's still in the world yeah yeah that's something that uh w- was a lot in the movie this kind of very grounded in the world kind of quality yeah, like all the all the back in time stories that they told, like all the actors, like usually when you when people play actors or like they're in ancient Egypt or doing some ancient humans, they're, they're like stylized in the way that they act and behave. It's kind of dramatic, but in this movie, they very much felt like, you know, people, but just mm. a little bit farther back in time, yeah. which I really mm-hmm. enjoyed. Did you did you also pick up on that kind of that vibe? Yeah, uh, I felt that with um, some of, like, Sheba, like, the, I don't know who Sheba is historically, admittedly, um, but, but, like, uh, they, they paint her in the movie as this, you know, basically a demigod, it seems, like, someone who's almost uh, immortal, like, a mythological character, and she seems like kind of just, like, a regular person who... Uh, she like gulps when King Solomon shows up and does some magic tricks and uh, she's like easily swooned by him but like simultaneously this this otherworldly godlike figure so I felt some of that there um, certainly the uh, concubine chamber that mm-hmm. felt very felt very real yeah, yeah. Told, well he's I think it's a testament to George Miller's uh, casting he i think he's really adept or i'm sure he has a casting director that he's near it's probably his wife um who um but but i think he's really adept at casting like interesting people um who seem to be real people not just actors and this is this movie is no exception especially in those you're right in those the tales whatever you want to call those scenes like yeah, they don't feel like um, they feel grounded. They feel like you actually know them as people uh, that the Jin knew them. You know, the way he describes them is very human, and so they appear very human. I think that's important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So, Tilda Swinton is a <laughs> <laughs> is a middle aged academic, uh, struggling um, with something. I don't know. It seems very like forceful in communicating that she's like happy to other people. Uh, so I've seemingly like something's missing in her life. So right. we meet her at like a conference. Is that right? She's like mm-hmm. going to. She's an academic... traveling to Istanbul for a conference. Istanbul. That's right. Um, Instant bowl, I think, is the the way you pronounce it. <laughs> Instant bowl ramen. Inst- <laughs> uh. And then she uh, starts having hallucinations um, before she even gets to Istanbul. Um, when she lands went, in the airport, the the handsy guy with oh, you man, know, yeah. jostling yeah. her luggage. What does he say? He just says the secrets of Istanbul. The mysteries, I think. The mysteries of Istanbul. Yeah. Which is an incomplete sentence. That's yeah. just saying. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's yeah he's like pronouncing the title of a movie to her. <laughs> That's like when the title card of that episode <laughs> comes up. Uh, I guess that was an instant bowl. So that's 
when she starts seeing stuff and then she buys a bottle um at some vendor at some shop uh and then we go to the hotel room where she is cleaning it rubs it accidentally releases Idris Elba as the genie is am I allowed to say genie like this movie has made me seem like it's not PC to say genie anymore I this is the first time I'm hearing about this no idea I they they call him a gin um so that's what I'll say but um I that's that opens an interesting question which I don't feel comfortable interrogating um uh to the world that I don't know like if genie is like an anglicization of gin or if it's like Mm -hmm. you know a bastardization that you're not supposed to use i have no idea yeah Uh, i watched this at alamo draft house and like the entire pre-show was about that oh yeah really what'd you learn just that it's like uh yeah genie is like a western term and it's more about just like the manipulation of like that character trope and all the things we associate it with that like as western media consumers so a lot Uh of like just uh dispelling like what we normally associate with those things and then by extension like the word it's i have uh, one connection western connection to genies and it's aladdin that's the only (laughs) i I assume that probably was brought up yeah yeah uh that was definitely i dream of genie um Mm -hmm. seventh voyage of sinbad Mm -hmm. was in there a lot which I love that movie for the record. Um, there were some others, but those were the, the big ones that stuck out and huh. the ones that I recognized. You have an Alamo by you? Yeah. There's like Hell three yeah. of them by me. Wow. Yeah. Like there's three in the Denver area. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. That has to be like the highest concentration. I guess I mean, so. other than Texas, I guess, right? If even. Yeah. I mean, how many do they have there? <laughs> yeah. One. I don't know. You'll never forget. They just uh, have one in the whole state of Texas. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's so big. <laughs> <laughs> you have to travel real far to get to that one. Uh, uh, but then for the for the movie, like basically the rest of the movie is just in that hotel, hotel room. room. The genie's telling stories. They're um, Tilda and the Jin are talking, and then it ends with um, you know her going back to London. And there's some more movie, but structurally that's kind of that's kind of what it is. You want to dive into the genie stories? Sure. He said, like, he opens up the the hotel room scenes by saying that that was his third incarceration. So I guess that means that that sets up the movie to say we're going to have three uh, granting wishes stories, flashbacks. Um, was there actually three? Yes. Is this three stories? Yeah, uh, yeah Sheba, uh, that crazy king guy with the sword. Mm-hmm. And then, like, the 18th century mm-hmm. uh, woman academic. Gold. Well, there was also the woman who uh, asked to get pregnant. Yeah, that was the, the... That's the crazy king sword guy. Yeah, that's the, that was the, like, long story in the middle. Oh, okay. Her name was uh, Gol- Golden or Golton, and then the last one was, like, Saphir or Zamir or something like that. Mm-hmm. Notably, uh, throughout the movie at least uh maybe i missed something but like when you get to the end of the whatever story it is he's in the golden bottle like the original one that king solomon put him in and at some point i was like is he like misleading like how many times he's been in the bottle because that's the wrong bottle Mm -hmm. like obviously he's in like the porcelain bottle later on uh but I think I might have just like miscounted or like you just pointing out that that one with the pregnant woman is actually like just a really long story. Maybe I just misunderstood like how many times he got put away. Right. Because that that second story, he's only put away once, but he has the stretch where he's invisible um, mm. and he's waiting for them to uncover the I guess it's the bottle, right? He's mm-hmm. he has to. Yeah, he has to uncover. Is it he has to cover the bottle? under the stone the is that stone right? yeah okay yeah, yeah. i, I love the little detail saying. about like how the the child that could sense him the one who like grew up and came back and like took over and was like crazy like th- that he had like hair on his legs and so was obviously a descendant of sheba which is why mm. he had the ability to sense him 
I thought he said he was a descendant of Jin. Like he said he had Jin blood in him. Well, Sheba was half Jin. Oh, is that it? Yeah. I see. She was Sheba was um Idris Elba's I think they were they were related. But they were in love too. They were in love, yeah. But it was a okay. different time, Trevor. It was a different That's time right. back then. Yeah. <laughs> uh yes. All right. So, so do, the... you wanna, do you want to go through the stories? Sure, sure. So, story number my... one is yeah. Story the, number one is the uh, uh, it's Queen Sheba. She is, is the. Does that count as story number one? It is. Yeah, that is story okay. number one because it ends with his okay. quote unquote incarceration. So that's his okay. like first tale. But um, that that one seems uh, interesting because it it seems like the most magical out of all of them right uh-huh. because, because it's like, farther back in time i think right yeah uh like king solomon is like a sorcerer yeah in that story um but you don't really see any like humans with like powers or anything like that in any of the subsequent stories it's like only then when like the line between uh like magical person and like regular human is like a little blurry yeah yeah with with a few exceptions but you're right i mean and solomon who i i first encountered because he's in the bible and then later as sol so there is solomonic magic he's like known as a sort of like um totemic figure in magic with a k um circles mm-hmm. right he is like yeah so a sorcerer uh he there are like grimoires you know about solomonic magic and so to be able to see that depicted on screen so like imaginatively is pretty cool because he Mm -hmm. has the of course the instrument is just insanely cool and what a what a great visual but also like there is that there's the montage of his like uh, exploits and one of them was like him i know it was like a creature whispering something to him do you remember yeah that? yeah yeah. because the queen like gave him several impossible challenges right. like guess oh, the name right. of my mother or something and yeah, get yeah. this random thread yeah and it's so the a, magical it's... kingdom comes together to like help a brother out yeah yeah, yeah totally yeah. well but and it's and you get the sense that it's because of his sort of his magical aura his being that he is able to move through these spaces and get the help from. Yeah, there was like a creature that comes down and whispers something to him. He has it's like, like a co- command of ants to do his bidding. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird creature. I, I believe the secret that the creature says is like what women truly want. Isn't yeah, that, right? that or his, it was a, I think it was a name. I think Solomon knew think what women the truly wanted. But the creature told him, because he's like a baller, apparently. He's like a magic and a baller. But I think the creature <laughs> told him, whispered the name of Sheba's mo- mother or like uh, a nickname or something that her mother had. Yeah. I forget. I forget why that was hard. Secret name. Yeah. Hmm. Carol. <laughs> Carol. <laughs> I remember Juanita. the creature looking kind of funny. Like, I can't really imagine it in my mind right now but it was like it seemed like it was like a it's like a star wars creature a star wars creature yeah that's i I wanted to say like a tauntaun or something yeah it's funny because i had a star wars it's funny that we all thought star wars i to me it it, i don't remember what it looked like but in my head it kind of looked like a uh biological version of the um the robots in phantom menace the ones with the like long Mm. heads wait Uh, what I don't know. It's not. It's not worth getting into. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It it also had like a Jim Henson feel to it, which I feel like, yeah. um, even if it wasn't practical, it felt practical. Um, and I think George Miller's good at that, like making things feel real, like you're looking mm-hmm. at something real, because it it's kind of slightly off or hinky. Mm-hmm. So, all that results in uh, while King Solomon and Sheba are. Uh, getting it on um what's the Jin's name does he have a name he just have, he's just called Jin. Mm-hmm. yeah Jin's like hidden on a pillar and solomon casts a spell and imprisons him for the for the first time and that's the bottle that like remains 
throughout however many thousand years until he gets switched to the, the porcelain bottle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what happens? He gets like thrown in the ocean. Is that no, right? No, not at that step, right? Or is it that, is that step? Um, he eventually. I don't. Uh, that's a good question. He eventually makes his way into a wall. I know that. I don't remember if he's in the ocean or not. Oh no, right. he is. He's, that's he's right. in the ocean. He ends up in the skull. He ends up in a skull of some sort. Mm-hmm. He, he's caught by fishermen. He ends up in a skull, and then he ends up as like a brick. Or in, yeah, in a, wall. a brick uh-huh. in a wall, where it's loosened by that girl who ends up wanting to get pregnant. Yeah, that's right. She climbs and like missteps on that brick. Uh-huh. I That's thought funny. she was just going to, like, wreck her body, like, falling off the wall, but it was not. Like, I yeah. reacted way too strongly to her <laughs> falling. Did you jump? <laughs> I was like, oh! It did make it seem like she was really, like, high up. Like, she would yeah. have died had she fallen on you. I w- I'm, I'm there with you. Uh, Yeah. And then that's the same story where he turns invisible, right? When that girl frees Yeah, him. it's like a uh-huh. multi-part story. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I didn't realize it was like a, a longer story, but the, the Shiba one was super short, very self-contained, and then this one kind of dragged on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he, so yeah, he meets a concubine. I think her name is Gol- Golton. What is a concubine? Just like a, like a lover, right? I'm not. Uh, I, I, I'm not qualified to talk about this one. I think I think just like a lover that you take consensually. And it's accepted by the court, no matter who. That's they what I've are. heard. The I court concubine. Just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like the court has accepted this person as your lover. I okay. don't know if you marry or what. If mm. you have their that, child okay. or that makes sense. Then why she would like, uh, why she wants like marriage and the child that she aspires to that, based on her position. Oh, so maybe it's like, it's yeah, a, it's a lowly position that she has. Right, right. It's mm-hmm. it's enough that you're close to him, but you're not close enough that you're married or you have their children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's what uh, that she wishes that she could have his child and that they could marry, and then that ends in tragedy. She killed. She's killed, right? Yeah, he's killed too. Right? They're yeah. they're both the father. Um, I don't remember why, but the father kills the sun and then it's because uh <laughs> yeah someone like someone uh tells the sultan that like the men like don't trust him as a leader anymore because he's mm. like spending too much time writing poetry yeah i think oh. uh and then his men are like hey no one uh no one respects you anymore and we're gonna <laughs> install <laughs> your son as the leader and so uh-huh. he kills he kills his son that's well, importantly, point. it's not that important. But like the reason that that like that the politics started turning against the favor of that son, the rightful heir, is because there was like this random, like the head concubine lady, right. who had her own son that she wanted to inject into the throne, and so she started doing like these like maneuvers, political maneuvers behind the scenes to, yeah, get yeah. that son whacked. That's right. All of that, all of that, like, I feel like that's a. Like that's a stars show, like that those politics we just described, <laughs> uh, and it happens like in thirty seconds. Like describe that entire sequence. Sure, of events. I there mean, was a lot is... of exposition. I was like trying. I was like <laughs> watching super intensely to try to. Because it's gonna be important in five minutes from now. <laughs> yeah, that that sort of palace intrigue. It either like grips me or it bores me to death. And I, I mean, I was into it this one, but. Sometimes when there's just like a name, a bunch of names to remember and all the people look the same or, you know, they're all just sexy people who have swords or low cut yeah. dresses. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. but you're into um, House of Dragon. Oh, Game of Thrones, too. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I am into that. No, it's good. This last episode was real Game of Thrones, incest and everything. Cool. OK, so I remember I asked you last time about this. And you said there was no incest. No incest, I but I was wrong, man. There's incest. Yeah, yeah. So now you're <laughs> you were into it, and now you're really. Into yeah, it. you guys know my proclivities. I mean, <laughs> all the way. Please cut that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And then um, the part that I do need a little bit just a refresher on is uh, what happened with the kid with the sword, 
going away and then coming back and then could, taking power. Well, he's like, kid was that? I think it was like just generations later, right? It was like, it was there some time? Yeah. Was like there a few hundred years or something, right? Because like the the bathhouse that he was under the stone in was like a walled off room. That That's right. There was there was a time jump for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it was a forgotten part of the palace, like where that kid ended up fucking. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So that was, Mus- is it Mustafa? It's Mustafa. Mufasa, I think that yeah. kid is Mustafa, and then uh, Ibrahim is the harem guy. So Mustafa is the kid who grows up to be. Yeah, he goes to war. He comes back, a total like loony. Um, and is that then, another real like biblical story, Mustafa and Abraham? I believe so. I don't know about biblical. I believe this was a real. These were real figures. Okay, I feel like um, I would appreciate the movie a lot more if I had any of this yeah, background. Same. Yeah. I. Um, and Abraham is the kid who, yeah, grows up to be the dude who's just into large women and fur <laughs> now that's in the bible i know that for sure <laughs> right yeah yeah let's talk about like uh the the orgy chamber right. let's spend a few minutes on that disgusting <laughs> so i gross. love well i love let's, let's not rush to judgment i love how the um you know you guys know what i'm gonna say the moment where he oh. like sticks his arm out of the oh. the the door or whatever just covered in what I assume is a mixture of splooge and other bodily fluids. Um, it's just a, it's just an image that's just designed to make me recoil. There's nothing. Yeah. It serves no other purpose. It's just like, look how fucking gross this is. And, when, and it's his mom, too, that he's slathering yeah. This, yeah. This, these fluids in, which is so What gross. is a mom thinking about his son just fucking jizzing in that room all day? <laughs> I guess what does any mom think about that? Right? <laughs> Hashtag it's, motherhood. I mean, it's not unlike a like like a uh, just like a teenager, right, in their room uh, with access to the internet, right? It's not not that. Yeah. Hold on, guys. No. I'm they getting a call might. from George Miller. Let's see what he says about this. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys uh, have like the little like a uh, clip of George Miller before the movie started? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I saw that, that was nice. It, yeah, way nicer than the Tom Cruise one, which frankly, you know, sort of frightened me. But uh, did he have one in Top Gun? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Real F eighteens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back to the movies. Mm-hmm. Um, did I ever I, send you? Sorry, real quick. Yeah. This is relevant. I promise. There was like a TikTok I sent a while back. It might have been after we both hopped off TikTok. Um, but it's of like a fight breaking out in the movie th- in a movie theater, just some like AMC, and like it's people like yelling like you 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 need to get the fuck out of here. like actual like, exclamations, and all the while it's that Nicole Kidman like <laughs> movie ad like playing <laughs> in the in the background at full volume. <laughs> That's, That's so, so funny. So wait, wait so what that. was that? Was that a real thing or a, 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 like an edited thing? It was a real thing. Yeah, I hate that ad so much. Every time it comes on, I just like <laughs> God, shut up. I saw Nicole it for the Kidman. first time when I went and saw Jaws last week. I'd never, I think I maybe seen it on YouTube, but I'd never seen it in a theater before. Oh, and, really? You don't uh, go to AMCs then? No, not really. Um, so it was, at first it's like the pointing DiCaprio meme where it's like, oh my God, it's the Nicole Kidman thing. And then it's pretty, it's a pretty anticlimactic thing. I mean, it's just Nicole Kidman spouting bullshit. Why, did, why, why is AMC's stuff so bad? They also have those like ads where they show all of these really like unrealistically attractive people like getting their coke and their popcorn and like being totally enamored by <laughs> <laughs> the act of going to the movies like it's the it's this novel thing that no one ever gets to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which is essentially the same thing with the Nicole Kidman right. ad where they right, just yeah. like they just holier than thou, they're so special. Sure. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. I I actually will take so the one of the worst offenders is because I go to Regal a lot because that's the one here mm, mm-hmm. and um and there they have this ad that's like this pre roll ad that's like um it's people it's that it's people like going to the concession stand going into the movie meeting each other but all the while they're saying movie lines to each other as dialogue <laughs> like uh-huh. famous movie lines okay uh you know like 
Um, here's looking at you, kid. Here's looking at you, kid. You think I'm funny. We're going to need a bigger mm-hmm. boat, blah, 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 blah. But it's like yeah. in the course of dialogue. And it's the worst piece of shit you've ever seen. But at least it like attempts, it, it, it doesn't attempt to be like um, aspirational or inspirational like something like the Nicole Kidman one is. Like It's funny, right? Rever- like it's not ad. reverent. It's not, yeah, of course it's not funny. It's dreadful. But it's like at least not so fucking over the top about the movies i feel like um you can correct me if i'm wrong about this justin but i feel like um being like irreverent in um in any sort of media that fits into that category like mid-tier advertisements used to be like an easier target and now like the easier target is just like be funny like be self aware because anytime you see like the amc treatment on anything you're like what is this like uh full of itself like bullshit right and now you're just like oh just give me like some jokes and like i'll i'll buy your thing i'll i'll take shitty jokes that make me angry over like this sort of fake yeah fake reverence right Uh, Mm -hmm. they don't really feel that way i feel that way about movies sometimes i don't feel like they do i think uh that's what annoys me is that i like i don't knock the message right but i i resent that i'm that i am that i am being like targeted sure. towards that message yeah yeah i just want to watch um, I, I, I don't want my truths to be told to me <laughs> back to me in the form of you know commercial advertisements right right, right. by nicole kidman right in a in a movie theater alone yeah this out of touch celebrity yeah looking as robotic as she ever has yeah, what's wrong with her? Why does she look like that? No comment. I mean, huh. it, the same could be said about Tom Cruise. There's, I think they're just total lizard people. And I don't mean that in like an anti-Semitic like, uh, conspiracy way. I just mean like just total inhuman trash. One of my favorite uh, Justin Wheatley quotes from way back. I mean, this is like paraphrasing, but talking about conspiracy theorists as like, the problem with conspiracy theorists is that they're right. It's just they're not lizard people. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, <That's> man. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the world is run by pedophiles. They're just yeah, yeah they're yeah. not lizard people. They're <laughs> they're real pedophiles. people. They're yeah, they're they're yeah, real our pedophiles. senators and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever. I'll shut up. But um, so that's the yeah the second story. Uh, you have the the kid grows up to be the <laughs> with Nicole maniac. Kidman in the AMC. With Nicole, yeah, that was the mission. <laughs> the kid grows up to be the maniac. The brother I, is. I love that character, like him coming back. And once again, like to, to the point I made earlier about how real the people seem. Like that guy just seemed like a legitimately uh, broken, violent, mm-hmm. impulsive human. Right. Seems like someone who like. I legitimately believe like suffered from really intense PTSD uh-huh. or like psychosis. Sure. Like sure. A real mental disorder. Like not unlike, you know, somebody you could encounter on the streets, you know, yeah. like unhoused it's not, people. It's not like this, like ancient concept of like madness. It's no, like no. someone who's like, it's actually, a real like, one struggling with something. But, yeah, but yeah. I will say, I think key to that is that the movie doesn't feel like it has to linger on sort of, modern notions of trauma it doesn't have to like try to bring into the conversation like what he's gone through we just Mm -hmm. all understand i feel like there's an impulse now to course correct decades previous where we just called it shell shock or whatever Mm -hmm. blah 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 yeah madness and then Mm -hmm. like ignored the fact that they were real and now there's like not to not to have a conversation about like woke or whatever but i do think there are like we we sort of think that okay now we have to interrogate what is trauma what happened in war you although know? i would have loved that just like another just make the movie 15 minutes longer <laughs> oh, and just, <laughs> just the, on that the guy war? the the is that what you mean like seeing maybe the... some more conversations between him and that old storyteller oh, sure. guy right 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 what did you bro dude real talk what did you see over there man <laughs> he's just like <laughs> No, I just like that the movie doesn't try to reach into this sort of 2022 um, way of thinking about PTSD. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know. but it did show, like, you know, th- the realness of it 
in a way. Like it neither Without... like rested sure. on an old school idea of a mad person or like a newer age treatment like, of mental illness. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, I think it's like two parts like performance and then just like context. Like we as a 2022 like audience like look at a person who's like performing that way and we're like that's like mental illness or that is like real trauma and we don't need any more information than that. And that's and, yeah. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're so lacking that. You're right. It's mm -hmm. con it's context clues, something that we learned in second grade, and it's us bringing our own knowledge. Like we don't have to be told that he's experiencing this, you know, X feeling. We know it, and I do mm -hmm. think a lot of properties now either don't understand that or choose to forego it, and instead, mm -hmm. fourteen, which I guess a lot of audiences are. Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. It's like just like a the the proper way to like treat that thing in movies going forward because everybody gets it. Everybody knows what's going on now. Well, I mean, I think it's like to the larger point. Like George Miller, I feel like uh, adult storytelling is not something you see mm -hmm. at the Cineplex anymore. And George Miller mm -hmm. Miller is an adult storyteller who knows that he's communicating to fellow adults. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of things are aimed at either the lowest common denominator or international audiences, which I don't mean to say that they're not to infantilize international audiences, but we have to sort of yeah. generalize the message yeah. to the to the point where things are lost in that translation, literally. Totally. Yeah, great points. All right, so comes back from war <laughs> is <laughs> is pretty messed up. I like how. It seemingly like we get off track but we like <laughs> we still have a north star at the end of the and i can't believe we've kept to it of, of trying to go through the movie linearly which we've <laughs> never done never and this is a podcast we're, first we're fucking doing it you know what i want to start saying because i hear it on blank check a lot now is just referencing people that no one who might be listening has any reference for or would know who they are and just say friend of the podcast Oh, okay. friend, of the po friend of the podcast Elizabeth Wheatley once sure. said yeah. <laughs> my um, favorite part of that crazy guy was him just drinking and then hitting the drinks with a sword <laughs> <laughs> that's right it was like the Fantastic. plot of somebody to just have him perpetually drunk all the time right right because right. this There's guy like mom, came into right? power and the people around him are just like holy shit yeah. Like, what do we do? Like, right. this is a real predicament. Yeah. It was a way to, like, keep him under control because he would yeah, just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would have done some crazy stuff. Uh-huh. And, and, I mean, similarly, the brother, Ibrahim, a way to keep him in control and from fucking anything up was to just lock him in a fur-lined room with women. Right. I, really quick on the orgy chamber, I really like the the tracking shot through the room just demonstrating all the different shapes and sizes of the women in there and how the the last one is like really tall and extends beyond the frame and he just like looks up <laughs> <laughs> like you would like a giant or something like in a cartoon you know now yeah. he too that character is somebody who is like almost as mentally unfit as his brother is in a different but just way, for the com yeah. in yeah. a different way, instead of like violence and and yeah, violence, it's just sexual stuff, sexual fetishes, and yeah. But they they both seem to have like brains that have kind of gone to mush a little bit. Which oh, you yeah. think, if you think about it, like especially back then, if you're a royal, um, how do you not either become an insane psycho who's seen the worst atrocities at war, or a pampered yeah uh, baby brained weirdo right like though i feel like those are the two modes of being when you're a royal. there's no there's no like moderation if right. you're like a, a yeah, royal yeah, yeah. in a certain time period and context yeah. man so much time of human history was like hinged on you know the personalities of these individuals who just like wielded all the power yeah just no filter between like the human nature of of these like really privileged powerful individuals and and the rest of society 
Yeah. 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 I guess this is a good time to pause and, and give our condolences to the um, UK. Um, we've lost our mother this week, um, Her Majesty. Yeah. Yeah. God save it, the queen. It always kind of makes me sad when <laughs> old people don't make it to 100. Like when they're shy of 100. When they're really close. Like when they're yeah. really close to 100 and they just they just miss it. Yeah. Yeah. This one wasn't too bad. But if you had like a 98-year-old, 99-year-old, you're like, gosh. Yeah. A century you could have seen a century yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i don't i don't think either I, I don't know if either of you are like nintendo fans like i am but i don't know if you saw today nintendo had like a direct which is like their thing they broadcast like new and um and they had pulled unexpectedly they pulled the direct from the uk like they weren't going to show the direct in the uk and people were like why aren't they showing the direct and then uh so the direct happens and at the very end they show footage from the new Zelda and they do the title reveal of the new Zelda, uh, which they hadn't previously. And the title oh. is T- Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, of course, speculation is that they, <laughs> they had to pull it last minute because of the title. It was very funny. That's funny. So, something I realized about the Queen, um, like probably last year, is that like I've never really heard her voice like that I've just not consumed media that would ever involve her speaking um so for a long time I just like didn't even know what she sounded like right like my entire life I didn't know what she sounded like right um and then only like after she died have like the has the algorithm like fed me these like montages of like top 10 hits the of the queen like zingers like queen zingers over the last like 10 watch years mojo top 10 <laughs> queen moments oh my god yeah yeah and in those uh so now my only context for like the queen of england's voice are these little like jabs like during pr- press events or whatever sure where she's like making fun of the the situation nice. super Brit- yeah super britishisms mm-hmm. i listened to her do like a radio broadcast during world war ii it was you like listen to- during world war ii that's amazing yeah that you were able to do that. It's incredible what you can do with, you know, a phone. <laughs> was, she like a, was it like a morning zoo type show where she's doing like sound effects? And she's bringing strippers into the studio. Yeah, she was doing bits with Groucho Marx. It was hilarious. <laughs> this is Queen Lizzie in the morning. <laughs> Dizzy <laughs> Lizzie. <laughs> her, her co-host is named like, you know, Fart King ben or yeah. something queen and the queef <laughs> yeah, 98.7 there you go yeah, queen yeah. and the queef yeah the monarch's number one source for classic rock <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh <laughs> so abraham <laughs> eventually becomes re- well i really liked the the storyteller that they bring in uh yeah who, like yeah. is the yeah. one guy who can connect to yeah did you ever hear him speak or like even tell a story? Because he was just part of a montage, right? I think so. I don't think we hear him. We just see him gesticulating and and not like not unlike the Queen, where not we unlike never the queen. famously yeah. sort of like animated person. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. What did you like about him? I don't know. I just, just thought that was a cool character. Uh, just like the one intriguing. dude who had the keys to this guy's brain yeah he he's yeah. the one who tell because because then it it kind of captures your imagination what the fuck is he telling him what kind of stories does this guy have and i yeah. and i really like that like i really like i know the whole movie is like you know blah 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 the power of story but specifically <laughs> i want to know what the fuck this guy had to say and like yeah. it makes you wonder like especially back then when oral tradition was all they had like what were these stories like? like yeah. What, 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 I'm, it's so fascinating. I have no idea. Yeah. Like, I, I have well, this would... bias where I, I think that I would be bored by their stories, but maybe I'm not giving them enough credit. Maybe they were fucking fantastic storytellers and like overall just great entertainers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, cause, cause like, I find, like, I that's... think stand up is great and that's just a guy talking. Yeah. So I mean, that doesn't no really reason exist can't do it back then. Other than niche, um, venues like stand-up but even that is like a specific kind of stand-up like there are storyteller stand-ups 
uh, or mm -hmm. people who lean toward that, but it's not the common mode of stand up. So like, I feel like it's, it is a really like bygone talent to be able to capture someone's attention with what is essential, not even a monologue. It's a story. It's a narrative, but to tell it orally is like, that's a totally unique skill. Yeah. Uh -huh. I had this, it, I had this thought the other day when I was rewatching, uh, I got kind of high and watched pirates of the Caribbean just kind of randomly. Um, and if you remember like Mr. Gibbs from those movies, he's like kind of the pudgier sidekick character. He like, uh, in the very beginning of the first movie, he's the one who's like, stop singing about pirates or like, it's bad luck to have a woman aboard. Remember that guy? I get a picture. Anyways, his, his whole character is like, he, yeah. um, whenever someone's like attention is like split for a moment he like jumps in with like a really fantastical story he's the one who tells all the stories about like jack sparrow getting off the island which are like rooted in nothing he's just kind of making them up is what you learn throughout the movies oh really? just making up the stories um and i th i had this thought where i'm like what he's doing is not a new thing nor is it like really a bygone thing depending on how you look yeah. at it because like when you're at a party and if you can like sense like the attention sort of directed at you and if you have like a good story in the can like you can really like ride a wave of like people's attention not on uh -huh. like uh doing a stand-up bit where you're just like all right i got i have these people and i have this like story that just by the nature of the way I tell it and the bullet points in it, I know that it will like captivate these people at least for like 30 seconds or something. And it's like, it's like a party trick. It's like, yeah. I'm going to tell this yeah. story at a party and I'm going to get some people involved. I think of my like cousins. Um, I, I think this is like more phenomenon of like larger social groups or social groups of at least of a certain size, certainly like classmates. You can like remember, mm -hmm shooting the shit for classmates and people like kind of competing for the ear of the circle. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I think of my cousins, my older cousins who, you know, before the age of the internet, they, they, they developed fantastic abilities to, you know, spin yarn and tell jokes and otherwise, you know, just be very gregarious and funny and entertaining. And it's, yeah. I think it's a little bit of a lost art now that we like, are so readily entertained. Mm -hmm. well, I, I we feel don't like, have, and we don't have stories because we have our tiles to entertain us, or we sort of we're we're closed off. We've lost that sense of community, you know, in our world. Like, yeah. I, I mean, Trevor and I have talked about this. Like, um, in fact, this is a common subject of ours. But like, <laughs> dreams, right? Our dreams yeah. were once uh, ways of dealing with. Um, the world around us like we would game out situations with predators and whatnot in our dreams and now our dreams are all kinds of fucked up and don't make sense and it's because our our lives don't make sense in an evolutionary way so uh -huh. like in the same way stories i mean when you live in whatever era this was um surely things were happening to you day to day that were far more eventful or incidental than anything that happens to us today I walk mm -hmm. to work and then I come back and I make dinner and I record a podcast. Like that's what, what story am I telling? Even, even if I live an exciting life, I probably don't have the kinds of stories that an average peasant would have, um, you know, back then. Yeah. A thousand mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. I feel this all the time that like people, even just a generation or two behind us, they just like led more interesting lives than we do. Or at the very least, they were much more skilled at uh communicating about those lives because uh -huh. in order uh in order for anything in your life to um be of substance or uh, in some ways it was like the only way that you documented things is like being able to like recall them in the context of a story and now you like everything is recorded and so it's like perfect recollection but if you can like retell something that happened to you in like an interesting way i also think just a lot of the past is just like bullshit and fabricated for that reason for like the uh in service of like theatrics 
because uh-huh. like there's no way to verify anything and like a better story is a better story so like sure you would take creative liberties with both things that you you would say about your own life yeah i i know a guy who works in the storytelling field and he has this line and it's whoever has the best story wins and i think that's true and that's especially true back then but um i know there are people like historians and scientists who rely on the past being um precisely documented and i get that but for normal people i think uh i think we've lost something in our precise recordings and on our price do- precise documentation of 2022 right like i feel like our lives are somehow uh less richer than they once were because there is less whatever you want to call it magic or wonder or mystery There's less, yeah less mystery yeah that's what i was gonna say yeah uh, yeah this whole movie really like touched on something inside of me where like it like almost unlocked a yearning for that a kind of yeah a longing oh. Oh. <laughs> no, a yearning like for i don't know just like everything we've been talking about especially like just the importance of telling stories and making up narratives because the whole movie is essentially just tilda swinton going through this process of telling herself a story about herself through the use of metaphor and fairy tales right Mm-hmm. Is that is that what literally is happening throughout the movie? There is no genie. Mm. I so well. I think that's a well, this, question. But I well, would... this is, is this like skips way ahead. To is, is that what you're asking? Is there? Yeah, you're right. Okay, so we're in the yeah. orgy room. Okay, we got all <laughs> these women. Well, I I do think so. We're right around where she opens up about her own past, and I do think that leads into that story well, because. Uh, well, okay, okay, yeah. Let's finish the let's finish that second story, and then I'd like to talk about that. But um, yeah. yeah, what's I, left I of that to write second story? I need I need to write something down because that sparked yeah. a thought in me that I want to come back to, and I will okay. forget it if I don't write it down. Cool. So he ends up yeah. going invisible. Um. Oh no! He's wait, been invisible no, throughout no, this I'm whole sorry. time. He's been invisible. Oh yeah, no, you're right. He's been invisible the whole time. He's, uh-huh. he's witnessing all of this. Yeah. He's witnessing all of this. I forget where, where that. Oh, uh, the old guy dies. The old storyteller guy dies, and the king, the crazy king, drinks himself to death. Right. And, and then I think he, then he's released by like one of the women falling on the stone, releasing him. Yeah, which is of questionable um, okayness. I I feel like that was a bit of a <laughs> cheap. That was a bit of a cheap plot point uh, to just have an overweight woman. Uh, Earlier, when when it. like the genie was like, "Oh, my fate would would you know is, is going to be decided by the fetishes of this king right. of this prince," and she's like, right. "Well, how are those two related?" And she's like, "Just yeah. wait and see." Yeah. yeah. I'm like, okay, a fat I'm, joke. I think yeah. I might have missed part of this. Is that you guys are talking about where she slips and like cracks yeah. the stone? Yeah. 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 Um, I, I do really like, and, and he uses this view a lot, where you just get the weird, like, blurry fisheye effect. He does that in, like, several points throughout the movie, and I really like it. It's just one of those, like, lo-fi camera techniques, or it, it's probably not in camera, but whatever he's using to make that effect, I think it's really effective, because the, there's not are much... You talking to- about- the POV of the POV, Jin. yeah, where it's yes, yeah, the Jin, but it's mm. like when the Jin is invisible. He mm-hmm. uses, he also uses it when she's at the beginning when she's seeing the dude in the crowd. Like it, just that weird like. I don't even know how yeah. to describe it. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a little like um, it's almost sort of like three D esque, where like stuff is, like you're seeing blurred like layers of things. You see like multiple right. right. Um, yeah, like what you would look at like a 3D screen if you weren't wearing glasses. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of what the, what that looks like. Yeah, I like it. Um, uh, so he's real quick about the guy in the crowd um, at the very beginning of the movie. Uh, that was really scary. 
yeah. like seeing that dude in the way that like he's it's very specifically color corrected in the same way that like mad max like did like eyes do you remember that in like mad max how like people there'd be these really like deep like dark like orange and black tones and then people's like eyes would be like bright like white and blue and people yeah. look like literal demons yeah in a scary way that same thing with like that guy and maybe even the guy who was in the airport just like really kind of scary imagery that i i haven't really seen anywhere else other than this and mad max at least in this very specific way i think that's like again like not only is it great casting but i think he just has a way of it's visual storytelling and it's visual like wit you know to be Mm -hmm. able to uh capture these things in yeah unsettling like the the little guy in the airport was unsettling but then i agree with you the dude in the crowd was just like kind of scary um and i don't Mm -hmm. know if you i don't know if you saw the little guy anywhere else but i did see the guy in the crowd in shiva's like yeah 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 yeah. i noticed that as well um but they never touch on that which i like i like that you're just left to connect those dots Mm -hmm. there's a couple of instances of stuff from the real life being showing up again in the stories oh really um yeah Hmm. anything else do you know do you remember anything else uh well i'm not thinking of this one's not not a great example but just it's actually does not a great example at all but like the the tray of food that the genie brings with them to tilda swinton was also in one of the older stories Oh, um, yeah. But then I'm thinking, well, the genie was also there in the old time, so I guess that's just something he likes making. But I like that. that yeah. He, yeah, that he just likes... It's his, like, order. Yeah. Yeah. Melt in your mouth. Melt yeah. in your mouth. really want to try those. Do you notice that uh, one of the neighbor women uh, to Tilda Swinton, like the British ladies, that one of them is from Mad Max. She's, like, one of the desert-dwelling women. Yeah, she's oh. the one that... Uh, points the gun at Morton Joe. She's like his, like uh, I don't know if she's his original wife or what, but unless no, that's you're not, that's not right. One of them is. This, well, they, okay, yeah, one of them is, and the other one is like, um, the Australian woman that like they meet at the end of the movie, where she says like, oh, cool, where she, she says something like, I kill, I, I've killed everybody I have ever known out here. Yeah, right, right. And she's the one who has seeds. She has, like, a bag of, like, seeds. Yeah. Um, hmm. Anyways, fun little George Miller connection there with those yeah. those casting. But um, let's wrap up this uh, story. Whatever, whatever story we're in right now. Um, yeah, so then he gets uh, uncovered, and he's trying to get the lady to say her last wish, but she refuses or wishes him back in the bottle at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Understandably. That's right. I wouldn't yeah. want him coming at me either. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's like, maybe I should have like, uh, maybe exercised a little more tact. Right. But he does. He comes he, right out of the bottle. He's like, quick. No, no. It's, yeah. I'm in a desperate situation. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. How he, he says that I was, uh, <laughs> I was probably acting a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get it. So not to prolong this story, but, just to go back really quick, I really liked the um, uh, point in the tunnel. It's still when Golton was alive. He's in the tunnel with her and the dude who's from the cult. Like they don't. That's this right. is another thing where they don't really explain it, but yeah. there's just a you know an, an op- opponent cult, and the dude like turns into a weird spider. Th- it's great. It's so he says I was inventive. like I was stopped by a follower of so yes. and so. Yes. Yeah oh yeah yeah yeah. the way that it's like said is really interesting to me too where it's just like i was stopped and like it never it doesn't even like make clear as to like what's going on between those two it's just his eyes turn a certain color and there's this invisible barrier that he can't move past uh and the dude turns into like a a, um john carpenter creature all of a sudden it totally is a thing a thing type creature yeah yeah his his head pops off and turns into a spider right yep yep yeah 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 uh i remember the people i was watching the movie with it was still early enough in the movie that we weren't quite sure like where the rest of the movie might go um 
And when that happened, they were like, is this going to be like that the whole time? Because this might be a little more intense than what I signed <laughs> up for. You know, like that was like a, a scary moment. Yeah. I love that it. it was really effective. And I like that they just didn't dwell on it and never came back to it. Yeah. yeah. But then it's just a great piece of world building. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. All right. So, what's, so he's, what's in next? The, he's back in the bottle, back he's in, in the, the, bottom ocean. In the ocean. Do you remember how he gets uncovered again after so much time? He was in a fish, and they're like gutting a fish, and then the bottle right. just pops oh, out. Yeah. That's right. And then the merchant, it's the the chef's or the merchant's chef finds him, and then like he gives the bottle to his wife, who's the the genius, um, the genius woman. Mm-hmm. It's in like the Renaissance, right? That's when that's happening. Am I wrong about that? Mm, I think it was a little later than that. I think it was. I say eighteen hundreds earlier, but I think that's too late. I I guess I just associate. I'm thinking that because she has that little like Da Vinci flying machine that she made. It's like the little spiral, the little spiral thing. So I just, I guess Mm. I assumed that like okay, they're in like the fourteen hundreds or whatever. Is that when Da Vinci time was? I'm, I want to place it like closer to the 1700s or 1800s, just the beginning of the scientific revolution. Um, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page, and it says mid 19th century. Okay. Okay. But uh, adds up. I like. I liked that. I liked that segment a lot. And like I said earlier, I like that. Like when she he grants her wish to be all knowledgeable, that that just entails her reading. Um, all the books in the world. That's right. What did you guys think of... They They make a very clear parallel between her and Tilda Swinton's character because they have that same tick where she'll very um, obsessively, like, read and, like, tap her foot or her knee, like, while she's doing it. They made it seem like... I don't know. To me, at first glance, it's like, oh, is this, like the same person is this tilda swinton or is this like a this is tilda swinton a descendant of this person or maybe it's just like a just a visual overlap between the two characters that's nice Mm -hmm. for the story well i I think this like what from what i brought up earlier about like what exactly is the nature of this story is it real is it a figment of tilda swinton's imagination yeah I have this. I have the same question, but I sort of refuse to give the figment of the imagination a lot of. Um, well, let me rephrase that. I, for personal reasons, I just like reject the figment of the <laughs> imagination uh, take because that's not interesting to me. Uh huh. This is you the know? classic. This is the story as old as time. The skeptic versus the believer. <laughs> You know, the people mm-hmm. that, you know, want the magic to be real versus the the grouchy pessimist who's like, oh, you know, <laughs> you're being ridiculous. <laughs> um, but so, Descendant, I mean, I think that's like a good explanation. Uh, yeah. I think it's an interesting, I think it's interesting to draw a, 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 some, I don't remember that being a, like a parallel between them, but I think it's interesting oh, yeah. to draw similarities between them because they're actually opposite characters. If you think about it, some Zafir Zamir, I'm forgetting her name. Um, she, so their whole dynamic, which I find so fascinating, is she comes to realize that the genie is um, manipulating her. Right? Um, mm-hmm. They they are they exist in. I guess a power imbalance doesn't really make sense because she's basically his equal by the time that she's all knowledgeable. But he has been manipulating her, and she sort of senses that now he. He has this sway over her, and she doesn't like that. Whereas the opposite is true of Tilda Swinton, that she has control over him because she's wished that he be her lover and that he love her. And when she brings him to the UK, Mm -hmm. he is totally like, it's fucking him up and he's dying and everything, but yet he's still like at her beck and call. And so like I feel like there's this interesting the distinction between those two characters that um the dynamics are opposite between them um but i'm curious to i don't know what that 
parallel would be if if George Miller's drawing one between them. I think that's interesting. Well, it's I think it's I would make the argument that it's like pretty clearly like a line drawn between the two because it's they there's like identical shots of mm. like the knee and the foot like tapping like while reading a book. Like I think Tilda Swinton's is like oh. on a plane. Yeah, I remember and that. I think and I think uh, Zafir is that what you said? Something like that. Zamir. Uh, hers is like in the study or whatever but it's like the exact same shot in a way that's is telling you like hey there's something these yeah it's saying like these are the same shot <laughs> that's all i don't well, know what it's I, saying I do, beyond that now that you're i do remember at the beginning of the movie um justin we're not gonna justify it anymore it's the same shot well no <laughs> I, um <laughs> so this one is kidding. reading the book by running her finger along the pages mm -hmm. and so yeah, yeah, yeah. the exact same thing mm -hmm. um, and i do remember thinking well that's interesting because when tilda swinton does it it just seems like she's just sort of this like voracious reader but when you see zafir doing it it feels almost magical like she's like sort of absorbing the information of the book um, mm -hmm. as she runs her hand along the page so johnny yeah, there better be style. some magic behind <laughs> it <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, I really like the story. Otherwise, like um, I think the dynamic between them, beyond just that whole her discovering the manipulation thing, like I I like that he goes off and finds the wonders of the world, and he comes back and describes it to her. And all the while, she's has this almost uh, um, non consensual relationship with this dude that she has to endure until she doesn't, until she's powerful, more powerful than him. I, I just mm -hmm. thought it was a great story. What exactly happened? She unlocked the, the, the powers <laughs> of sex and just like rocked his world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, oh, are you happy? That's like all he can think of. <laughs> yeah. Pretty what bad. was that? I think that's it. Like she, that's what I'm saying is at, she got to the point where she was basically a djinn without being mm -hmm. a djinn. Like she had like approaching magic powers and mm -hmm. i think she yeah like, used them that yeah i think that's supported our... by the fact that like the stuff that she was learning like one of the final shots of like her triumphantly you know unlocking the magic of science was her deriving maxwell's equations of electromagnetism oh i didn't so... i was gonna ask about that i was gonna ask like if what she was writing like meant anything at all yep I That's just remember, she... just remember seeing her like circling something, like at the end of a at the end of an equation, and then like crying. I I remember like some of the shots of like her derivations where she has like such huge fonts on pieces uh -huh. of paper that she's doing math on. I'm like, write smaller. This is why so... your your room is so disheveled because like <laughs> you're taking up like a whole page for a few lines of math. It doesn't show up that well on camera if you write something. Yeah, yeah. That was actually my thought. Uh, I remember thinking something similar, except I thought, like, well, back then, like, paper wasn't wasn't s scarce, but it wasn't easy to come by either. Like, you got to conserve that shit. She was, a, she was also wealthy and seemingly had, like, a magical That's true. resource of books. That's so. true. So, like, it... Uh, I don't know. It's probably like not unlike how we use like electronic paper now, where it's like infinite, and so like our electronic usage of paper is uh, just inherently more messy. Like I don't know about you guys, but like my my workflow is just like chaos as compared to anything that I do on paper because paper is like I I have one shot at it yeah, if right. I'm writing something down. And I imagine that, like, with her, it's, like, if she had, like, a magical reservoir of paper, she just treated it, like, how we would treat, like, a note, a virtual notepad. Right, right. Yeah. So what else so happens he, after uh, that? So he transports into the melted-down bottle, which I like, too. I like the, the visual of those, the mush oh, on the... super cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, uh, let's, how did it, something happens where he goes into the bottle... And she wishes that she forgot about him entirely. And they make it seem like it happens just like at the right, like at the right second that it's, uh, it can't be undone. 
Yeah. Where, like, she got her wish out just as he, like, went into the bottle. Yeah. And uh-huh. then there was, like, nothing He was more putting himself into the bottle voluntarily to try to placate her. Yes. I believe that's right. He's like, oh, no, I'm not going to be as clinging anymore. I'll put myself away. Don't right. send me away. And then at that mm-hmm. moment, which I guess he can't get out of the bottle by himself. I guess that's the way that's they the work. That's the rules. And yeah. then, yeah, she... she asks to forget him which is something that tilda swinton i think also like line for line word for word almost said the same thing in the hotel room like i wish we had never met something like that something like that that's in the trailer and then and then that's when he got into the bottle that finally tilda swinton picked up Mm -hmm. the blue Mm -hmm. one with the stripes yeah because it was like a collection of bottles it was it was part of the same collection of bottles that Zephyr, I'm just gonna say severe because whatever. Um, where she kept all of her knowledge, right? All of her yeah. like, mm-hmm. secrets of the universe were contained in all these bottles, and so she just had like an eclectic yeah. collection of these. And things. that bottle, that bottle specifically, there's a shot, like an insert shot of the old dude's hand putting it down, like as if it's a gift to her. Like he just was bringing her bottles left Mm -hmm. and right and that was just one of them so it is very like unceremonious in one way it's just a random bottle that her captor essentially brought her that's right yeah uh and then what how does he i guess he they do they ever say how he ends up in the shop um no no i don't think so yeah i mean i guess it's not that important but yeah and then we then we're at tilda swinton and then we have the Hallmark movie that proceeds after that, where uh, they, uh, she wishes for his love, and then they go and live like a little life together in um, England? Yeah. London. Yeah, yeah. In London. I think so. Mm-hmm. I'll say, I think that was probably my least favorite part of the movie, and then it didn't, this is what I was thinking like while watching it, and then it wasn't rectified by the end. So I'm going to give that last, you know, fourth of the movie, like a solid B minus. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I think, uh, I think I just wanted a little more, um, meat on the bone, like in terms of like why she made the decision and maybe a little more, like even like 20 minutes longer in London, I think I would have been satisfied with. It, it really like quick. caught me by surprise that she asked, you know, to, to like, be in love with that with the genie i had the same reaction it i really tried to, didn't i tried to ask the people i was watching with about watching it with about this where like her kind of out of the blue wish of like i want that same love like felt a little unjustified to me but like i don't mm-hmm. know maybe i like just missed something i think it's i mean i think there's it's um two things one you learn that she has this emptiness and this yearning for human connection that she's lost Mm -hmm. one from a miscarriage and two from her husband and she seems to be on this like long quest to she's she's searching for she's actively seeking it even though she's telling herself that she's not and even though she's literally compartmentalized it Mm -hmm. in her basement that she seems to nevertheless be on on the on a quest for it and then you also have the fact that he's a magical being who seems to woo women and who he says women like her are his type like he just says that so i feel Mm -hmm. like after you have those those two factors plus the fact that we're led to believe that they've been sitting in this hotel room for 12 hours listening to these romantic epic tales i think Mm -hmm. i do think the movie itself like i i would have preferred the movie to be a little longer and a little more sort of drawn out in its narrative um because i understand why people think that it was sudden i don't think it's unjustified or necessarily like out of left field that she feels this way i think she Mm -hmm. sees an opportunity and jumps at it well i guess i just didn't see a lot of like on-screen evidence that it was building towards that because 
I, I mean, there's the the moment when I forget what prompts it, but she does like the gulp thing, like the insert shot of like the gulp that's the same shot from like Sheba when she is wooed by Solomon in the very beginning. So it's like this callback or whatever. So I remember seeing that and be like, oh, okay, she's like into him. But like outside of that, I didn't see a lot of evidence that she was really being wooed by him specifically. Like I uh, agree with the fact that there's like this very large emptiness within her, but I didn't like, I wasn't able to immediately connect the dots between like, oh, he's the guy who's going to fill it, obviously. Yeah. You know, I just, yeah. it, that was like kind of a leap for me. And, I, I don't, I... and I'm not saying that I'm not, I, I think that I'm wrong. I think that I, I just like didn't no, I, interpret something. I think you're, no, I think you're right in the sense that um, I don't think the movie does the best job at portraying that evolution in their dynamic, their relationship. Um, Cause it does, uh, you do go from, they, they get, they become friendly with each other, but you go from friendly to, I want you to come with me. I do think, I, th I think what we are supposed to take away from it, at least what I take away from it, is like she has kept this, um, she has like a really thin manhole cover and underneath the manhole cover is all this like yearning and, and longing, right? Longing and she needs this hole filled. Um, no entendre intended, but like, I think that as soon as she meets him, that manhole cover is like easily blown off and yeah. she's like great you're, a, you're stop a using sexually charged language justin jesus I know, christ I know. manhole <laughs> covers blown totally, I know. but but i think she's like she she has that um that mask on and then it's very easily torn off and as soon as it's torn off she's like i have a fucking genie in my room i may as well jump at the opportunity and also it's idris elba there's like a sexy man in my room who's right. uh, five thousand years old and knows all about the yeah. world so like i i kind of like think all those ingredients add up to a logical conclusion but i agree with you that there's the filmmaking doesn't allow for that to really grow like it should mm -hmm. yeah you want to know how i understand it hmm. and this relates back to like the discussion that maybe now would be a good time to have about like what these stories are to her yeah i i think that these stories are like a way for herself to try to understand herself. So I think that all the stories relate back to her, at least the first and the third. So I think in retrospect, looking back, the first story about Chiba, this very sexual being that is just like the embodiment of beauty is like, is a conduit for her to try to understand her own sexuality and like the very human need for, you know, physical connection as well as emotional I think that the answer to like what all women want from the first section, having taken the whole movie in as a whole, something along the lines of like being idolized, um, given being given like manly attention and just being like sexed out of your mind, something like that. Something very carnal. Yeah. Yeah. This is not me saying it. This is what I think the movie is trying to tell me. That's what I desire as a, uh, as a man. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's not gender gender specific. Uh, and so that's yeah, what I, I think it is. Like, I think that's the first story I think is like maybe where the answer lies as to like where that stuff came from, from within Tim Swinton. Yeah. I think that's like as good, a, good a take as any. Yeah. Um, I do like by the end really question like the reality of the whole thing. Um, and it does kind of start to cut the, the the facade kind of starts coming down like towards the end too right mm -hmm. the one if i if i really want to like get into the weeds of like is it real is it not real the one piece of evidence i have is like the fact that the neighbors are aware of the gin well um, that and we can't forget that he kicks a soccer ball toward a bunch of teens <laughs> at the end of the movie well, that's that. I don't know. I feel like you could explain that one away with some hand wavy, just like maybe. What she kicks the soccer ball, or just that like the the soccer ball. What are the chances like, of that? Yeah, 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 who knows what that one was? But like the fact that someone acknowledges him. Yeah. Um, 
But what I wanted to talk about, the thing that I wrote down is the, there's a, a period where they're living in London where he, or it's like at the end, right? Where when he discovers that the technology or electromagnetism of like the modern world is unbearable, that he has to like leave and he can only come back and, and visit, I guess, as like episodically. Um, the, in order to sort of like maintain that relationship sh or whatever you want to call it, she writes everything down about the Jin and does little sketches of him in this notebook. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. they, he has like little drawings of Idris Elba. And earlier in the movie, she's talking about her like imaginary friend yeah. when she was a child. Yeah. And whatever his name was, and that the only way when she felt the imaginary friend sort of slipping away out of his out of her own consciousness, that the only way she could like tether herself to it was by writing down this like book of facts about the friend and like did little sketches of him and that was sort of the way that that character remained like tactile in her life. And so the fact that she did the exact same thing with the genie just made me feel like, oh, is this just, like, imaginary friend, like, version two that she's having to ground with this, like, book of facts? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's, like, the, my number one uh, in support of it's in her mind theory was that, that she's done it before, created an imaginary person. Mm-hmm. But it, the other, like part of me when i was thinking about that was like was he because the imaginary friend story kind of comes early in the movie when the re the reality of the magic and idris elba are not in question at all mm -hmm. at least for me so when i saw the imaginary friend story i was like oh is this just like is the imaginary friend a djinn or some other sort of like magic, <laughs> magical yeah, character yeah. that she's uh, attached to like is that another layer of this movie that I'm just not understanding but towards the end I just I chalked it up to like imaginary and maybe the genie is also imaginary so when I I yeah I mean I I drew that connection too but I think for me it was all like purely thematic and that's partly because um like you I just through all considerations of it being a figment of her imagination out the window because that's like narratively cheap yeah mm -hmm. um especially considering what this movie is about which is like um uh the sort the the way that the real can uh create these uh, can conjure these stories that then go on to dictate our lives or change our lives for the better but like the fact that the djinn see like we talked about earlier seems to exist in the world in tangible ways i think mm -hmm. only supports the fact that she doesn't like if you think about the imaginary friend he's just he's portrayed literally as like a, a pen and paper drawing yeah. who's come to life um but he's just a pen and paper drawing with the djinn it's like you feel the weight of him and the physicality of him and the ramifications of the of him in the physical world. Um, he feels real. Hi, Stacy. They say hi. They said hi. She says hi. That was nice seeing Stacy. Um, I will like just for to play devil's advocate. I don't disagree with you, but like just as you were talking, I was just thinking of ways to undermine you. Um, <laughs> some uh, things never change <laughs> uh, but what if um, you know that Idris Elba being this like fully fleshed out like physical thing that has uh, rules that are grounded in like science maybe what if that's just like her adult brain like connecting the dots whereas like when she's a child it's just this drawing it's just this character where that's easy to conceive of as like a child like you don't need any supporting evidence that the the character is any more than just that um 
but as an adult and especially as like a sort of a troubled adult what if like subconsciously she's doing all these mental gymnastics and like creating this lore of like electromagnetism and like clearly this thing like if it were to exist like this is how it would exist and that's something that those are all rules that she's coming up with like subconsciously does that make sense you hear what i'm saying it does but i think i'm struggling to see what then the point of the movie is which seems to be a very pointed movie Mm -hmm. um because uh, that's ultimately like a pretty cynical and or sad narrative that you're describing. And I don't think, I think all evidence points to the movie not being that, being a one of hope and uh, change being possible. And because if on, this, on the surface, the narrative you're describing is a woman has endured tragedy in her life and she's lonely and she remains lonely and alone and yet she has a, an imaginary character to, to keep her going. But I would mm-hmm. rather believe that George Miller is trying to tell us about the power of stories through a kind of magic in the world that exists alongside technology and blah, 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 blah. Um, and, mm-hmm. and maybe that's just me as a viewer wanting that, but I do think it's ultimately a more interesting and like a more affecting story. Um, and so I'm, I'm choosing to side with, with him on that. Yeah, I I as I alluded to earlier, I choose to be on that side of things as well. I just really like to entertain the idea of it being all mental to like exhaustion. Like I want to take all evidence that could possibly point to that and like write it uh, down and well, see like see like how much water way. it con- conceivably holds. I, the the one thing that we haven't brought up that I think is very important is that the whole movie is framed as her like in world story that she creates. Like by the end, we see that she's like basically written like a story, right. or maybe it was the journal that you said that she made. But I thought it was just like she wrote a story, a novel or something about this experience. And yeah. so that I thought the whole movie was like a, a telling of that novel. And so the genie shows up as like a real life entity and it looks like everything that's real because it's within the fiction of her story retelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and now I'm trying to remember what her, what exactly the content of her lecture is at the beginning of the movie. Cause she's a, she's a narratologist, right? Which is a a wacky term that I had no, I didn't know it was a real thing, but (laughs) she, she studies, she's like professionally studies narrative and do you remember what it what it's about? Yeah, her lecture is about how like um, science always will over time supplant stories because like the um, the utility of stories and religious stories are to explain the like outer rims of our understanding. And as we understand more sure. about the world, like stories themselves are less and less relevant and less useful and so science will always take the place of them so she's uh yeah and that's that's how she behaves when she talks to the the djinn too right where it's she get she gets it all like all of this is all of this is bullshit um i see through all of it there's no need for all of this pageantry of, of storytelling Yeah, so that's interesting then if you think about it. On the one hand, we are sort of like given the science of the djinn or as much science as we are able to comprehend. And Mm -hmm. yet, despite that, he still has this intangible, like unfathomable connection to the magic dimension where he has these powers that we still can't fathom. And so like, if you think about it in that way, he represents the antithesis of that lecture because there is still stuff that science seems to uh, dictate and yet cannot explain or or at Mm -hmm. least our science cannot explain it right so like our our laws don't compute with his laws even though both seem to exist in the same world i feel like i've talked to raul about this this is veering more into just like (laughs) high guy like perception 
I'll go uh, get my com- drugs. Conversation. I'll go get my drugs. <laughs> Is this a good point for a bathroom break? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll okay. allow it. I'll allow it. I'll allow it. I will go get my drugs. All right. I'll be right back. It was funny coming back to this screen with neither of you here and just seeing (laughs) Justin's background because (laughs) both like Raul and I have like seemingly just like empty rooms and like it looked just from like a distance it looked like there was like an actual guy like in (laughs) Justin's screen. That's what I thought when I like approached the desk from far away. Yeah. Speaking of which, Trevor, I'm only just realizing the you have the Garden of Earthly Delights behind you. Yeah, what yeah. is that? I like that. I like those paintings. Yeah, that's uh, Bosch. Hieronymus Bosch. Huh. Um, they, co- they go together like that, those three? Yeah. Yeah, three panels. Um, oh, wow. It's just like a really... If you just look it up, Garden of Earthly Delights, uh-huh. you can look at a mega scan of it on Wikipedia. But just like really like bizarre stuff like a real collage of things isn't justin isn't it like garden of eden earth and hell yeah left to right yeah yeah wow and how'd you get them i just printed them i mean like that mega scan that i just referred to on wikipedia is like literally enormous like so big that you have to like download it on your computer in order to to just view it Uh uh-huh so when i discovered that that was that that was just out there and i'm sure that many like older public domain paintings have that exact thing but that particular one i really liked and i like just i like the idea of having something really large and collagey on my wall so i just printed those on like a canvas website where they ship stuff to you cool cool yeah i have a big space above my bed that i'm waiting for the perfect piece of art to put there Mm-hmm. And so I, I yeah I, I I really appreciate the the bed art in particular. Yeah. That was my venture into that territory. I have a you guys hear like a honking on whose end? I don't. I think it's I think it's on my end. I think it's my, someone's car. I mean my pet duck is in the backyard. I don't know if that's what you're referring <laughs> to. <laughs> Uh, what were, we, what were we talking about before the before we left? Um, oh, about um, like Tilda Swinton. You had a high guy, a high guy observation. Yeah. yeah, you were just talking about like the um, science, science, like dictates rules, but um, they are still like beyond understanding or something like that. Um, what I was gonna say is like. I feel like I've talked to Raul about this. Like science seems to have like a, like an exponential um, relationship with how much is known versus unknown. Like every time like a new like discovery is made, it reveals like an exponentially like larger void of things that we don't know. Um, and that always like, for me, it just like points back to, uh something that i just like fundamentally can't and never will understand about the nature of things and so if you want to call that like genies and magic sure 
fine. I, I'll believe it in in a gin. But it just uh, it feels related to what you were saying, where it's just like yes, science like has all of these rules, but there's so much that I just like can't understand. In spite of that. Yeah, I mean, science operates like it, uh, it presupposes that we don't know everything, right? It has to it operates on that principle. So, um, and getting back to her lecture, which is what spurred me onto that, like, um, I think we, by narrative structure rules, we're led to believe that she's experienced some change in the movie by the end of the movie. And I think we are led to believe that, that change is whatever she's established at the beginning as her thesis is different at the end of the movie. And if her thesis at the beginning is science and what was it? Science and narrative. Is that what it was? Science and yeah. Stories. Yeah, right. Stories sort of not being able to coexist or at uh -huh. least coexisting in a fraught way. Mm hmm. Um, I think maybe that's a little like grayer for her by the end of the movie. And it's because she's in love with the gin. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. What else makes sense? Why? Like the, the whole ontology of the magic is one that combines science into it. So that the science mm -hmm. and the mystery and the stories are all of the same thing, which is why the genie is electromagnetism. Yeah. It's not totally so, unknowable. It's just unknowable yeah. by, our standards and our rules it still has rules mm -hmm. do you guys remember um i think it was the, the story of the renaissance woman fear was a mirror whatever um there was like title cards during that sequence where one was just like electromagnetism and then like several oh, others yeah, yeah. that followed which i can't remember any of the rest of them. The, but the like, last one was like development of organs. I think that's okay. the yeah, that's the gene that's the genie becoming human, right? I thought what? That's, like, that's take, not like, what taking, I thought. I'm sorry, take not becoming human, but taking form. Oh. I forget the first like the middle two. But to me it was just like a very condensed story of uh, evolution of humans where it's like mm. you start with electrom electromagnetism yeah. and it. fundamental forces and then i forget the next two but then you get formation of organs i've i kind of thought of it as like because it happened during that story as the revelation of that some i guess that like just the evolution of humans to um that character whatever her name is that like mm. that was her discovering like the nature of reality that like you uh -huh. start with the base element that that makes up all matter and then like at the end you get to humans that that was her figuring that out huh although like interestingly in the in the canon of the movie electromagnetism is not what makes humans it's what makes the jinns mm -hmm. that's what i mean that's why i thought it was the formation of the jinn but yeah um I mean, it makes sense that as she accrues that knowledge that she sort of then seems to intuit evolution. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I just, I really want what to know say? what it was. What does he say? He's like, if I'm, uh, if you are made of dust, I'm like subtle fire. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. Which is a good way of just like differentiating between particles that have mass and then like electromagnetism and forces. Mm -hmm. They're like the two main things of physics. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's so cool that it's like, oh, humans are this and they are the other. Yeah. Right? And yeah. yet again, they exist within the same universe. They operate by the same laws. We just can't really understand how they affect those laws or how the laws affect them. Mm -hmm. That's great yeah i love this but but at the end of the movie like the Jin was very concerned like when he woke up in our time because like he was talking like as if humans had not only unlocked the sort of secrets of electromagnetism and technology but that we would also go much farther so like at that point in the movie like the Jin seemed like he was very dwarfed by humanity like it seemed like at that point like he felt that he didn't have any utility anymore. He didn't even really have any special powers compared to what we can already do. Really? Which what? It, I didn't. I didn't really pick up on that. 
I felt um, like I felt like towards the end when he's are you talking about like the montage when he's living in London and he sort of like does his little tour of like modern humans and like goes to like a hospital and sees brain surgery and yeah goes to like other places and observes things yeah um like his sentiment is that like oh you guys have out have outlapped us outlapped me really because i felt like he was describing that in more of a uh what a what a fun little like scratching of the surface that you've done like ironically Uh, yeah um, like he's like you guys have like done so much that it's like fascinating but it's like still like there's so much more on the other side that you guys are just like not aware of Uh uh-huh that's how i I interpreted it but maybe there's some dialogue that i'm missing Uh uh-huh i mean i think regardless both are kind of true because i think we are probably led to believe that he still in some way has like powers that are that uh are dominate over our powers that are more he's more powerful than us yet he's fucking dying in our world so mm-hmm. even though he may like be able to still grant wishes or something um he can't exist here and mm-hmm. you know his mm-hmm. powers have limits um he's not all powerful um yeah have you guys it, ever it, heard of the, the idea sorry trevor but just like the idea that magic is something that's relegated to the past and that something about the advancements of humans has sort of pushed out the magic. Like, mm-hmm. I think people that believe in magic will be like, Oh, like it did used to exist, but not as much anymore. And there's no need for it. Uh huh. And then, so yeah. yeah. So like our modern world kind of killing the gin kind of made me think of that idea. Well, and that's kind of what you were just describing is him. If he is speaking in an ironic tone, he's saying you, you see no need for us because you think that these grant you wishes or mm-hmm. that these are magical. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like blending into your background. It's like your phone is disappearing. <laughs> That's really funny. That's really funny. Just um, invisible. But, but I, I, that like, was magic right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Here, check this out. Can you like... Uh... Is this your card? <laughs> Wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> is it like sm- is it like got smoke on it or something yeah it's because a gin got a hold of the card and wrote die bitch on it um <laughs> so so i mean uh yeah so i i don't know exactly if you're if what you're describing is um in that sort of ironic tone um that people think they don't need magic anymore or don't have magic anymore but I certainly think that that kind of gets at the same idea. Mm. Yeah. I think it's all speaking to like the big theme set up at the beginning of with the big Ted talk lecture is about the role of, it's just like the fact that like we're becoming as a society, as a world more secular and we're kind of shedding off um, the, our, our history of, 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 magic and storytelling and all of these traditions um that's what i think it's trying to speak to you know more so than like the character of tilda swinton or anything like that um gosh i wish i knew what i was trying to say (laughs) i had something um before you cut me off raul and it's gone A genie in New York City. Talking about... Uh... Oh, I got it. Um, so his, like, inability to survive in the modern world... I think you, like, kind of framed it like this earlier, Justin, where... Uh, maybe you didn't, but... The electromagnetism in uh, the modern world... Abe Jin was saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, that it almost seems like it's a it's like pollution, but at the same time it's um it's still 
part of what makes up him. So while like humans have tapped into like the secrets of the universe, in this case, like electromagnetism and technology, that that is like the fabric of any of everything, and we've been able to harness it. Um, but we've harnessed it in sort of like a grotesque, um, inefficient, and like very noisy way that's not conducive to the way that like a gin or magic works where it's maybe under those circumstances it's more pure or it's more elegant. powerful more graceful elegant. Yeah, yeah elegant where we've created like a gross misrepresentation of uh the forces of the universe yeah. that mm-hmm. was sort of that was sort of my take on him commenting on like humans and technology is that it's just it's like the same ingredients, but you have like a much weirder cake that you've baked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, like uh, if you compare it to Mad Max, and this is totally off the dome, so this might be a stupid point, but like Mad Max, the concept is we've totally destroyed the world, and a new society has risen up, and we have protagonists and heroes and, and characters we love within that society. And yet we're not led to believe that that is the right path for society. That it's good that the world ended so that we could have Mad Max. It's a tragedy that the world ended and that Mad Max is who he is and in the state that he is. And so even though we root for like Furiosa or Max, um, overall humans have still destroyed the world. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's a, a winding thought, but mm-hmm. I'm just trying to think of it in the context of his career, like his other films or what he seems to be interested in stories he seems interested in telling. Yeah, <clears throat> I like how it's almost um, if this movie is like a I don't know. I guess it like by the end, if we're accepting that like um, it is a happy ending that the movie does endorse like magic as something that's valuable um what i was gonna say is like if this movie is like talking about us shedding um story and tradition and religion in favor of like secularism that like mad max feels like the opposite of that (laughs) uh it's like in that society like they have no regard for uh, science or knowledge it's all about like like the war boys are like a cult that like worship this like larger than life uh figure in their world and like water is this like magical substance that only like a few have um <clears throat> that like that that world like through the lens of like the people who occupy it is much more like uh grounded in like religion and stories and tradition than yeah the yeah. secular world of 3000 years well and what's funny i don't know how this squares with that point but like uh gasoline is basically worshiped right it's like the coin of the realm and that and gasoline is super inefficient and uh-huh. only kills the world further right so right <laughs> I love how, like, their religion is, like, based around, like, an old technology that's just... Yeah. That they that they simultaneously are, like, mystified by, um, but also understand very fully. You know? Right. Like, they're all, like, gearheads. They all, like, get how the cars work, and they, like, fucking yeah. spit gasoline into, like, the, the, like, the engine directly. Uh, like, they get it. They understand how the machines work, but, like, at the same time, they're like, these are these holy relics yeah yeah. are like connected to something larger than us whenever like one of them dies i remember i like i don't know i said something about this like in a in like a class discussion when i was in college how like when one of them dies they do this with their hands right uh Uh and it's like so good i think it's it's supposed to represent like um like a v6 engine yeah. Like the way that like cylinders are lined up in an engine. And I'm like, what a crazy little thing that like 
is just in that movie. Mm-hmm. Part of like the super dense world building. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and also like, uh, there's no question. Uh, whatever is implied to have happened to the world, there's no question that fossil fuels is like um, sort of a prime offender there. And mm-hmm. the big joke of the movie is that that's like the, again, that's like the folk, everyone's, that's the MacGuffin of the movie. Um, mm-hmm. So the state of the world is due in part to the thing that everybody's fighting for. It'd be a cool like alternate like Mad Max movie if like, the world ended but everybody worshipped like clean energy right if everybody was like if they came across like a tesla they would be like this is like the holy grail <laughs> this is like the but they're, covenant even in that situation <laughs> there'd definitely be like an offshoot barbarian clan that uses yeah. gasoline right who would inevitably like take over the planet again right because they can like harness energy more quickly and like aggressively yeah <laughs> with like a with a v8 engine yeah. that's funny yeah it's like the old it's like what we were talking about with uh the old world being just at the whims of these like powerful humans it's just like in that world it's just whoever has access to like uh like a v8 engine is like the king because that's just like the quickest way to enact technology and violence on other people around you yeah it's not even like that it's the best technology it's just like it's the quickest one to like assert dominance over other people i do like this idea of a world where like there are factions that are a different like blank punk you have the gas punks you have the renewable punks renewable punks that's i don't like that i think (laughs) There's a, I was going, I was in some weird, like, wiki site about all the punks, all about all the blank punks. Uh, and there's a cool one that's, like, more future focused that is, like, sort of more renewable energy based, sun based. Okay. What's nature that? Nature based. Um, maybe solar punk. Solar punk. Yeah. But think, like, a Hayao Miyazaki movie, you know, yeah. some, like, technologically Remember, I... advanced, but in, in sync with nature sure that's well, always that's always like the best version of like future movies right it just like yeah, makes, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. makes you feel really good uh-huh yeah yeah trevor and i had a conversation about punks i think when what what was that like were we trying to come up with our own punks were we like well it was each other to i think that like it was probably like a spinoff if, if it was just you and i from a conversation raul and i had about okay. like okay. trying to classify the okay. different I didn't want to ask. Punks. I'm like, oh, you and Justin also do that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not what I mean. You well, think. I well, I remember specifically that we landed on um, on a, I don't remember what we called it, but it was like uh, the mad Chem scientist. Chem punk. That's right. Chem punk. Specifically, yeah, yeah the, we did talk the about sort that. Sort of um, the la- like a the laboratory that canisters. Um, it's like... yeah, canisters and beakers, but but like mm-hmm. um, uh, where poison ivy came from, right? That with the crazy. Yeah mad scientists like that whole scene that's chem punk for sure and and the uh yes. i saw that movie recently or did we watch it recently um the batman the big, movie right the big the strong guy bane yes the, who i think he has like canisters on him or something yes he does yeah He's it's like, like greenish yeah it's like it's like mad scientist it's like mad scientist like uh with just i don't know more stripped down like technology yeah and it's very like neon like with bane it's just like these bright like neon like tubes of like liquid going through him yeah uh with a canister back there yeah that's chem punk for sure yeah it's great what else is like in part of solar punk is that like i was just about to go to that website <laughs> <laughs> well i would say that um uh going back to fury road the citadel has those tall natural pillars right whatever you would call that natural formation Mm -hmm. but they're like they're sort of topped with these drapey greenery yeah and i kind of feel like i don't know if that's specifically solar punk but that has that same feel where it feels organic and 
nice you know like a like an oasis Mm -hmm. yeah oasis oasis punk dude someone's like car alarm has been going off for like 20 minutes i swear to god huh probably a pet duck but uh you know peck someone's car do you think people actually have like pet ducks yeah they made a video i used to have ducks you used to have ducks oh yeah they would just like, eat like wood chips and shit. They were ridiculous. <laughs> they either all What's died the... because of that, or they were hunted off because they all died. <laughs> What's the utility of, like, was this like in a farm context, or you just like have like pets? Like in my pets? house, my dad's house. It's kind uh-huh. of farmy. So, what's the utility of having ducks? Because like any animals on a farm typically have like a purpose. No, we just liked them. We <laughs> just like ducks. Yeah, that's great. Look at this, 1800s age of cell frontier living, but with more bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> more bicycles. Wow, that's not what I expected. This is great. Aesthetics.wiki.fandom. Mm. Yeah. I don't even know how we got on this. Just talking about, oh, I can, that was weird. I could see, like, the zoom window like two layers of it uh we were just talking about punks like uh as it relates to george miller worlds and technology Uh, yeah yeah um i was gonna ask you guys what you think uh three thousand years if you could like call it a, a type of punk like what what punk is this like fantasy and like story and then like bullet point some of the the aesthetics of it Mm. well the movie's kind of split into like two sort of identities right you have the um hotel room and you have the tales so uh i don't know i don't know how to describe those like because there are specific kind of like the 1001 nights kind of feel to the to the tales right these fantastical things mm-hmm. set you know 2000 years ago it's like a but it's like an ancient like you know storytelling format with the whole science and technology rules like electromagnetism like there's this lore that goes along with the 1001 nights thing and i feel like the combination of that of those two things is like what is where you could derive some sort of like punk aesthetic you know it's funny because i almost feel like the like the whole ethos of punk is a rejection of that old world like you know aesthetic because like what the original punk i guess is like cyberpunk right the original punk is punk right what? <laughs> the musical genre or what? Um, yeah, I'm way out of my element here, out of my depth. Uh, out of your punk. Know. Silk Road punk. Okay. <laughs> Magical call... realism punk. Yeah. Well, yeah, which Mag- would just be magical realism. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that set a term and then added punk to it. Name and it's magical realism. But... I put no effort into creating a unique <laughs> Point punk <taken>. subgenre. <laughs> Nonfiction punk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess magical realism is is how you would, yeah, you know, how you would characterize it. Wish punk. Wish Punk. There you go. That's, Wish that's Punk. I, I like punk. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you guys think of this movie? Is it a good pandemic movie? Have you guys thought about like the concept of pandemic stories and pandemic media? How it's changed movies? I liked it. I liked... I really liked the sort of scant uh, presence of masks. Like... Yeah. Yeah. On public transport or in the crowd, yeah. um, especially when they were filming. I'm sure that was almost a necessity, but um, I don't know. It felt it felt accurate, and um, I feel like a lot of movies seem to reject it to their detriment. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like yeah, you'll 
you'll notice when movies seem to be pandemic movies or TV shows. Yeah. Um, it was, man, yeah. to talk about this in more of a, a real context, that was something that was like really strange, like working in video in social media, like for that, for that period where there was always this, um, question of like featuring people masked or unmasked in like public stuff that we were producing and like the argument was always like oh if we film people masked like if the pandemic is over like in a few months like that footage will look weird and (laughs) outdated or something Uh and i i was always on the side of like well that's just like what things look like right now like that's we're not misrepresenting anything by like filming people in masks. In fact, it's like, it's probably more appropriate that we film people in masks because that's like a better sample of like the time that we're in right now. Uh-huh. Uh, I-, I can see the reluctance though. Cause if it was just like a more temporary passing thing and now mm-hmm. you have the masks in your thing and somebody's watching it later on, they're like, Oh, this is commenting on that thing. Or mm-hmm. like, you know, and to include it is to then like, you know, you're making a comment about the pandemic. And if it's not something you wanted, I guess. Yeah. It, it took a it, while for it to kind of like. It trans it's transcendent now where it's like the presence of masks, like doesn't necessarily mean anything other than it just takes place at a certain time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's what I really liked about the public transit thing and i also think it's pretty wild how they pulled it off in that way because justin like didn't they start filming like like pre-covid i think like wasn't it was this movie it was definitely delayed like by the start of covid it wasn't Mm. like in the middle of it and so like to that end like a lot of the footage that i shot in like 2020 is like everybody's in masks all the time wherever you are in any scenario whereas like the further along that we've moved like you will only see masks like in the way this movie shows it where it's like on public transit or in i don't know other particularly like sketchy situations or in like healthcare. um but this movie like i thought was really interesting because i knew it started like a long time ago but the way that they portray masks and the pandemic feels very advanced it feels very 2022 masks versus like 2020 when they probably started filming if i'm not yeah. mistaken no i mean i agree so i thought that was like really cool like however they pulled that off like maybe they filmed all of the hotel room scenes uh just assuming that Like, the same thing that I was describing, where it's, like, we'll just film it without masks, and then, like, let's assume that, like, the world is different, like, in a few months. Uh Uh-huh. And that, like, then they had the leisure of just going out and getting a few pickup shots of, like, being on the bus with a mask. Crowds or buses, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So, maybe it was just, like, luck in that way, but I thought it was cool how, like, if the movie truly did start three years ago, and now it's, like... Uh, it feels very perfectly like of the time just in the way that it portrays masks alone yeah. I thought that that was like really impressive well the most notable shot of the masks to me was the TED talk lecture and I thought at the time that I saw that I was like oh there must have been like a meeting in a room it's like what percentage of people in this crowd are going to be wearing masks and I thought that what they showed me is very much 2022 like i thought it was very exact to like this moment the level of mask usage uh you know take keep in mind that it's like an academic event and so that would also Mm -hmm. lend itself to maybe more mask usage than you maybe you would expect Mm -hmm. um but yeah everything you said i was i'm also curious as to how much of those decisions were made and therefore manipulated like in the post-production process (laughs) just photoshop some masks on the ground Honestly, dude, that was, like, a question, like, with some things that I was involved in. I was, like, always... I I think everybody was always, like, against it. Like, that's crossing a moral line if you were ever to, like, (laughs) Photoshop a mask on somebody. But I remember just for, like, a brief moment, people were like, 
could we like fake it like in this particular like photo or video or, or something it's always very small use cases but like yeah it's different for me because i work in like advertising and like i'm documenting like real people but like in a in a movie context like you could easily just be like all right uh we filmed this like completely maskless in 2020 but like it feels a little more appropriate to have some masks on like 10 percent of people in the crowd so like that's an easy enough or uh, fix. the opposite if they filmed in 2020 i wouldn't be surprised if there were a bunch of no masks, masks and maybe they thought well it's right. now 2021 when we're in the post-production phase maybe we go back and see if there's a way to huh. And I don't know how feasible it, it is. That, that might... Is that why everybody in the crowd had the same mouth and face? <laughs> yeah, it is. They had like <laughs> the sort was weird. of like, yeah, the big <laughs> lips that just w- move like this. <laughs> it's definitely easier to uh, add masks than it is to remove sure. them. Yeah, yeah. I, I would reckon that's the case. Um, but yeah, so to your earlier point, like, I don't know. He's a smart guy, clearly. I wouldn't put it past him to have s- sort of had forethought to the future of masks and how do we portray that in a more accurate way once this movie, you know, the time of this movie is released. But mm-hmm. so this, this movie was really made that long ago and has been just delayed. The release has been delayed for a long time. Not the release. The production was delayed. I think they started like right before COVID huh. um, like that month or within those months. And then I don't think they started back up until like summer or fall. Uh-huh. Um, but I wanted to pick a... up an earlier point. Or what, what do you what do you think, Trevor? I wasn't going to say anything relevant. It was going to be a personal question at Justin. But continue. I want to just reel in uh to pick up an earlier point about it being like a pandemic movie, you know, in terms of the masks, yes, but also in terms of the themes that it brings up. Loneliness, I guess, being the most mm-hmm. prominent one, and it's uh, punctuated by the shots of her like walking through the crowds with her mask on. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, um, alone in the back seat, and then she has the neighbors that are just awful little shits that she can't connect <laughs> with. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you really get a sense that she does have like a lonely existence in London, and for him to be there with her is a total shift in her whole life right not just the fact that he's a magical creature but that she has someone in her life with her yeah they become part of the same pod (laughs) yeah (laughs) gin pod yeah uh do you guys recall um can you guys recite the three wishes that she requested the first one was to like have him fall in love with her Mm mm-hmm that's right. Um, second one was I wish you would talk or wake yep. up. Right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Oh, then I don't know about the third. Third, third one was I, I wish you would go back to the place where you belong or where you're where you can exist. Something like yep. that. Yep. That's right. Presumably oh, like the land of Jin or whatever, wherever he comes from. I don't yeah. know where else he would go that <laughs> he's capable of living like comfortably like Dr. Manhattan on Mars. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm just, that's I'm a just great, thinking of that shot. What a great parallel there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause even that he, he cool. goes there, he, he retreats there when he's like getting interviewed on the television and all the fucking humans are like interviewing him aggressively. Uh-huh. He's like enough. Basically that's the, in the same thing. That's in the movie, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's very funny. It, he goes to Mars because it's like a quiet place, right? That it's not. Yeah. There's I mean, not the humans line? there, and there's there's no technology there. I wish to be. Yeah. yeah. I I I wish to be free from their tangle, their stupid lives, or however that line goes. But I guess once you leave Earth, I mean, really, any place you go will meet all of those criteria. Maybe he just likes Mars. Yeah. We're pretty concentrated (laughs) right here. All eggs, one basket. Mm Mm-hmm. For now. Until Elon starts terraforming. Or whatever. 
I think uh, I think I will wrap up my thoughts by saying, um, if I think the the idea that it's all a figment of her imagination is like not additive, not an additive element to the story. I mm. think that's a subtractive element to the story. Whereas if it ends and you are led to believe, or you do believe that he is real and he comes when he can and they maintain this love between them and she gets to have these, this story that is meaningful to her. I think that's, that is a fully satisfying story. Um, yeah. And I'm happy mm. with it. I, I, I wish the movie, I think the pacing of the movie um, is off and I wish they'd spent a little more time on their relationship but overall I I quite enjoyed this movie and it's going to mm. be one of my f- favorites of the year I think That's for all right sure. want to give it a rating um we'll come back to it yeah uh I think that the uh figment of the main character's imagination is a subtractive element to any story Yes, I agree. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's no surprise here. Uh, I also surprisingly enjoyed this movie. I th- I think the context in which I saw it was really f- funny because, as we talked about earlier, I was like ready for like a wall to wall like action trippy, uh, leap out of my seat movie, um, because of the trailer. But then, like, Justin sort of spoiled that for me. Not in, like, a way that I uh, didn't like. It was just, I knew that it wasn't, like, what the trailer represented. And that uh, made me concerned about, like, the guests that I had invited to, like, watch this movie with me. Um, But despite that, I and uh, my co-watchers really, really enjoyed it. Um, and it was very, uh, it, it was like the opposite of that wall to wall thing in a way that was very satisfying. It was so subtle and quaint and slow. Uh, I just, I was able to let the movie just sort of just like wash over me and Uh I wasn't like aggressively interacting with the movie in any way it was more of like a spa movie for me i guess that part of that is just that the fact that they're in (laughs) bathrobes and towels the whole time i felt relaxed just like watching that (laughs) uh so yeah it was like a surprise um outside of justin telling me it wasn't the trailer um but despite that i really loved it and I was really satisfied that, like, it also, like, checked the boxes of the people who I thought might not be into it around me. So, I'll give it a uh, eight and a half. Uh... I'm taking Sex Dungeon, so you can knock it off with that idea. Uh... Eight and a half um, self reassembling Solomon instruments out of 10. Oh, so cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I, I, t- I couldn't agree more with like how the trailer portrayed the movie versus what we got. I really appreciated that it was like a more. You're being like stepped through the movie as opposed to being like a Yodorowsky style assault on the senses. Mm hmm. Which is what the trailer looked like. I, that's that's the first association that I had was like Holy Mountain. Um, I'll draw a bit of a, I go a bit against the grain here as far as like versus whether the movie is. Uh, can you hear? Can you hear my a little bit of rumbling in my background? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Stacy was in the kitchen. What was she rolling a boulder? <laughs> It's doing something. No, just like very loud plastic. This is like a common theme in like meetings now for me where it's like the technology that like filters out the bullshit in your background has gotten it's so, so good. It's so good now that people are like, oh, I'm so sorry about the noise. And like everyone in the call is like, what are you, <laughs> like, what noise are you talking about? And I feel like an idiot for even bringing it up. 
um no but just as far i think it actually i like viewing the movie as just this is tilda swinton a very troubled character using stories and her imagination as as a way to make as a way to understand herself and then ultimately get better because then it becomes like a very human story about tilda swinton and the power of story and i think what george miller is trying to say is that that way of telling and using stories is how real humans have used those for millennia now. I think he's trying to comment like the role that that had in history was as a therapy and a way of understanding the world and a way to pass down information and, and teach us things, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, which is what I, yeah. So that that's, I, I like the way of looking at it like that. And and it still allows me to enjoy all the mysticism because it's like really fun to watch and whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, while also grounding me to reality because I am an adult. <laughs> <laughs> adult so, movies for adult audiences. <laughs> George Miller. Uh, and for those reasons and more, I will give the movie a solid eight orgy dungeons out of 10 great no nine voluptuous uh concubines out of 10 (laughs) sounds like part of the like uh, 12 days of christmas (laughs) (laughs) thanks for listening film hole is produced by just us myself and raul our music is by w that's underscore the word double and two u's get film hole wherever you listen to podcasts If you like it, rate it. If you hate it, maybe don't. Thanks again. See you next time.